Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us today. My name is April Wepler, and I am the Engagement Coordinator with the Canadian Environmental Law Association, or CELA. Our webinar today is the first in our four-part four webinar series titled, Where's the Protection? And we're discussing the review and reform of the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, or you'll also hear us refer to that as SEPA. And SEPA regulates a broad range of things in Canada, from the most dangerous pollutants to plastic manufactured items to genetically engineered animals. Today's webinar will focus on the problem with SEPA. Before we get into our webinar, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. I'm calling in today from Guelph. I live on the banks of the Speed River, and I'm on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee peoples and on the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and neighbors of the Six Nations of the Grand Watershed. And please feel free at any point if you'd like to share your own land acknowledgement in the chat box. You're also welcome to introduce yourself in the chat box as we'd love to know who's joining us today. I'll start off by telling you a little bit about the Canadian Environmental Law Association or CELA. We are a specialty legal aid clinic within the Ontario wide network of clinics funded by Legal Aid Ontario. We work to protect human health and our environment by seeking justice for those harmed by pollution and working to change policies to prevent such problems in the first place. As a legal aid clinic, our top priority is to represent low income individuals and communities and to speak up for those with less of a say in decision making. We are pleased to be co-hosting co our session today with Nature Canada. Nature Canada is one of the oldest national nature conservation charities in Canada. For 80 years, Nature Canada has helped protect over 110 million acres of parks and wildlife areas in Canada and countless species. Today, Nature Canada represents a network of over 100,000 members and supporters and more than 800 nature organizations. Nature Canada is engaging in the modernization of SEPA in order to protect the genetic integrity of wild species and ecosystems and to ensure that Indigenous people's rights are respected. A quick bit of housekeeping before we get started, um, a reminder to please keep your microphones muted during the session so that we don't have issues with background noise. We are recording the session and we'll share the recording link as well as any slide decks and resources uh, via email with all the registered participants after the session. If you have any questions during the session, please feel free to pose those in the chat box. You can send me a message directly if you're having any issues, or you can share questions with everyone um, if they're questions about the topic or for the presenters. And we'll be addressing questions during the discussion portion of the webinar. So as I mentioned, you're also welcome to introduce yourself in the chat box at any time. I see some messages starting to come in there, that's great. So on the line with us today, we have some folks from CELA, including myself, Feda Leon, who's our researcher and paralegal, Joseph Castrilli, who is counsel, and Zoe St. Pierre, our current articling student. From Nature Canada, we have Mark Butler, senior advisor and lead on this work for Nature Canada, and Hugh Benavides, advisor to Nature Canada on CEPA reform. And you'll likely hear from many of them during the discussion portion at the end of the webinar. Our speakers today will be Miriam Diamond and Mark Winfield, both of whom I will introduce just before they present. Before I introduce our first speaker, I want to do just a couple of quick polls to better understand who's joining us for today's webinar. So if you've been to one of our sessions before, you will be old hand at this. Old hat, old hand? Hmm. Uh, so I've launched the first question here, which is just what sector do you represent? So if you can just uh, give us a sense of what organization or what type of organization you work with. And if I haven't covered off your industry, feel free to click on other there. And you can also let us know in the chat box so we can have a more complete list next time. Okay, lots of others. So tell me what I missed. <laughs> Gonna leave this open for just a couple more seconds. And I think it's always fun for everyone to have this information. So not surprisingly, we have lots of folks on the line from non-governmental organizations and happy to see a few from government and academic and students, some media and industry as well. All right, next question I'd like to ask is, this is always just a fun one to get a sense of geographically where everyone is in the country and test your knowledge about whether you know what watershed you're in in terms of uh, ocean drainage basin. And if anyone does click on other here, I'd definitely like to know where you are, where folks are coming from today. Okay, I'm going to give this just a couple more seconds. 
So I can see people still clicking away. Okay. And let's share this back. So most of us here in the Atlantic Ocean Basin, but definitely some are most from the Atlantic Ocean Basin, also some from Hudson Pacific and lots of others. Well, a few others. So let me know where you are in the chat box. Okay, last question. This is really helpful for our presenters and in planning our future sessions. If you can let me know just generally what your knowledge level is about this topic. I know it's really broad, so this might be a tough one to, to decide. You might feel very knowledgeable about some aspects of SEPA and, and still have lots to learn about others, but if you can give us a general sense, that's really helpful. And I'm just going to leave this up for five or 10 more seconds. Okay. So this is often where things land, most people identifying that they're feeling somewhat knowledgeable about the topic, which is great. All right, so thank you for that. Before I introduce Miriam, I would like to invite Hugh to unmute his mic, and he just has a few words to share with us before we get started. Thanks, um, April. Uh, unhappily, uh, I need to do a tribute to a colleague um, whom we lost on Saturday. Um, Professor Meinhard Duell died unexpectedly and all too soon on Saturday, September 17. It's almost inevitable that I won't be able to pay proper tribute to Meinhard in the short amount of time that I have, but I'll try. Meinhard was uh, a professor of law at the Schulich School of Law at Dalhousie University since 2003. Prior to that, while teaching part-time for 10 years. He was in the private practice of environmental law for six years and the executive director of Clean Nova Scotia for another five years. In those early years, he was centrally involved in drafting the Nova Scotia Environment Act and the first regulations under the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act. He went on to a doctorate in law in 2005 and became a full professor 10 years ago in 2012 returning last year from a two-year professorship at the World Maritime University in Malm, Sweden. Among many university roles, perhaps dearest to his heart was his longtime role at the Marine and Environmental Law Institute at Dalhousie Law School. Meinhard was serving as the faculty's associate dean for research this year. Meinhard was a remarkably prolific writer and editor publishing on climate change and environmental assessment as well as on various aspects of marine and, marine and environmental law. He even published a concise guide to the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, our topic today, in 2008. But these are just dates and numbers. To so many people, Meinhard was a reliable colleague and collaborator and friend. He was a mentor, not only to countless students, but also remarkably generous in offering his time to untold community members and friends, always there to give reliably thoughtful advice and ideas. Among many community contributions, he was the founding chair of East Coast Environmental Law when it was reborn in 2007 and served on the board of Ecojustice for seven years. Mark Butler and I consulted with Meinhard just last week on our proposals for part six of SEPA. He was always optimistic and positive, but not Pollyanna-ish. That must have been how he found the energy to serve on landmark panels, including one proposing a new regulatory framework for aquaculture in Nova Scotia, one on strategic environmental assessment for tidal power in the Bay of Fundy, and one on the environmental assessment of the Lower Churchill Power Project. He was a current member of the Technical Advisory Committee on the Federal Impact Assessment Act, among his many, many other contributions. Amidst all of this, Meinhard was a very good friend <clears throat> to many. He loved to run and cycle, and he loved music. And above all, he was a dedicated partner and father to three smart, amazing daughters. Thank you for joining me in paying tribute to a remarkable friend, colleague, and scholar whom we already miss terribly. Thanks. Thank you very much, Hugh. Thank you for sharing those words. <clears throat>
All right. Uh, well, with a deep breath, I will continue. Um, and at this time, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Miriam Diamond. And Miriam, if you want to go ahead and share your slide deck um, while I introduce you. So we'll be hearing first from Miriam Diamond, who is a professor at the University of Toronto with a research focus on understanding chemical contaminants from emissions through to human and ecosystem exposure. She is active in promoting sound chemicals management at national to international scales, having been the co-chair of Canada's Chemicals Management Plan Science Committee and Ontario's Toxic Reduction Scientific Advisory Panel. She is now a member of the Scientific and Technical Advisory Panel of the Global Environmental Facility and Vice Chair of the International Panel on Chemical Pollution. Miriam is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, Royal Canadian Geographical Society, and Society of Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry. And I'm just going to PS onto the end of her bio that she's also on CELA's board, and we're privileged to have her part of our team. And with that, I will pass the microphone over to Miriam. Good. I just had to remember to unmute. Um, thanks, April. And um, uh, words of support uh, to your colleague, Hugh, who has just um, had an untimely passing. Today, I want to talk about, um, to lay really the groundwork, uh, well, the part of why we need CEPA reform. Um, this is a, a, a webinar sponsored by CELA and Nature Canada. Uh, in January, colleagues and myself published a paper in which we pronounced that the Earth is outside the safe operating space of the planetary boundary for novel entities that include chemical, chemicals, waste, and plastics. What does that mean? So the safe operating boundary, if we look at this, this graph over here, imagine that you've got chemical exposure. Let's just say, oh, let's, let's say it's a PFAS. And you want the chemical exposures to be down in this safe operating space below which ecosystem health will not be adversely affected. We find ourselves now in a zone of uncertainty where we have ample and clear documentation, numerous types of documentation showing ecosystem sorry, showing adverse effects to ecosystems as well as to human health. That's leading us to be outside the safe operating space of the planetary boundary, which frankly is a scary place to be in. That's why we need CEPA reform. So why did we decide this now? Because of the weight of evidence. The weight of evidence is now uh, over, we believe, overwhelming that adverse effects are happening at local to global scales caused by multiple chemicals, their pollution and waste. Part of that weight of evidence and why we say we're outside the, off, the safe operating space is because of the incessant rate of increase in the production, in the production of total uh, chemicals and the number of chemicals that far outseeds our capacity for assessment and by far vastly outseeds the rate and at which we are succeeding in controlling those particular chemicals. What's changed over time largely? Toxicity assessments. Toxicity assessments have changed. Take for example, the US EPA drinking water advisory that went from 70 to four nanograms per liter just about a month ago. Um, four nanograms per liter for PFOS, four nanograms per liter for PFOA. Order of magnitude decrease because of better understanding of adverse effects. I mentioned the unrelenting rate of increase of chemical production since the 1950s. Total global chemical production has increased 50 times. It's poised to increase a further three times to 2050. This graph shows, for example, um, 
increase in production capacity because we it's we actually don't have data on actual production. Uh, for example, of the total chemical industry, look, plastics. It, it, the story is the same for um, numerous different chemical categories. It's alarming that we don't have safety data for the vast majority of these substances. Globally, 350,000 substances are registered for use. Now, we don't actually know if they're being produced and used, but they've been registered. 70,000 have been registered between 2010 and 2020, of which 30,000 are registered in emerging economies, which um, our analyses show do not have sufficient capacity for evaluation and management. There's just simply insufficient chemicals management capacity in most emerging economies. 50,000 of these substances are confidential, so we actually don't even really know what they are. And 70,000 have ambiguous chemical structures. If you don't know what it is, you can't measure it. 10,000 substances have been estimated to be used in plastics, of which 2,400 are of concern. What about Canada? Well, I can't tell you a lot on this. What we do know is that in 19, I can believe it was 1984, we came up with a domestic substance list in which 23,000 substances were listed. But that, that, that's long ago. Some of them were grandfathered in, some are in use, some aren't in use. Um, 4,300 of these were prioritized through the Canada's Chemicals Management Plan. Uh, we've largely plowed through these, but what about the new substances? All I found on the web was that the Food and Drugs Act includes something like 9,000 different substances. Um, the EU REACH has 23,000 substances of which 80,000 have yet to be assessed. I won't even talk about the US because that's big bad in terms of chemical assessment. Short of it is loads of chemicals, lack of transparency in Canada to even know which chemicals uh, are being used. We, we don't produce a whole lot of chemicals, but which chemicals are being used. We don't know very much about most chemicals. Conversely, we know a lot about very few chemicals. So this graph shows these very high bars. These, these bars are the, um, this is chemical one, chemical two, chemical three, for which um, much of the information has been published. This is for ecotoxicity. The vast majority of chemicals, and that's not like, we're talking 100 chemicals here. We're not talking about 350,000. Um, have like just minimal research on ecotoxicity. Last month, uh, my colleagues, uh, Ian Cousins in, in Sweden, uh, wrote the paper that, we, that um, pronounced that we're outside the safe operating space of the new planetary boundary for per and polyfluorinated substances or PFAS. This is illustrated in the figure showing different jurisdictions. Here we have China, uh, Sweden, we don't, uh, this is US and Canada. So these are um, urban uh, measurements of PFAS and rain from urban locations, rural and remote locations. And way down here is the US EPA drinking water advisory, which I mentioned was just updated. Why are we outside the safe operating space? Because just these four substances in rainwater often greatly exceed, as in by orders of magnitude, health-based limits. It's a global distribution of PFAS brought on by their incredible persistence. Okay, now moving into SIPA. So I'm, I am not an expert in SIPA, but what I do know is that SIPA is the overarching piece of legislation that um, aspirationally is an act respecting pollution prevention and the protection of the environment and human health in order to contribute to sustainable development. I like the visionary statement. Um, the visionary statement um, expresses the aspiration that chemicals 
should not be impairing ecosystem and human health, which we know is contrary to a lot of evidence. What I do like about CEPA is that it embraces, at least in terms of the act, the precautionary principle, pollution prevention, virtual elimination, although maybe that's on the chopping block, the polluter pays principle, and science-based decision-making. What could go wrong? <laughs> well, CEPA needs reforming. So that was, uh, you know, 20 years ago. The world is moving on because during the time in which CEPA 1999 was produced, we saw a whole lot of new chemicals introduced and the incessant production of more and more chemicals that are literally filling up the safe operating space. So what reforms are needed? Some procedural forms that were needed are needed first. Strict conflict of interest rules to minimize or at least give transparency to lobbying efforts from vested interests. Those are interests who have a vested uh, uh, in, uh, bodies who have a vested interest in bringing doubt that we have sufficient scientific information to act, interests that say this is not a problem, that um, have that do not use a precautionary approach to interpret scientific evidence, and who cast doubt on the need for strong action. Second, we need support, as in money, for independent regulatory toxicology science. There is hardly any independent toxicology science without some connection to vested interests that goes on in Canada right now. Sigh. Okay, so what reforms are needed? Just looking at the time. So, CEPA and chemicals management runs according to a risk paradigm. I want to mention that the risk paradigm was increasingly adopted in step with the, the risk framework developed by the US. In the 1970s and 80s, Canada used much more of a hazard approach. We've really become deeply wedded to the idea of risk, of, of risk assessment and risk management. What's the difference? Risk is comprised of both exposure and hazard. Hazard refers to the inherent properties of chemicals in this case that cause harm. In other words, toxicity. It's, but it's not just toxicity because when we're talking about the safe operating space, let's remember that for example, CFCs, HCFCs cause uh, stratospheric ozone depletion. That's, big, that's harm big time. So uh, we should think broadly about inherent properties. So it's not just toxicity. Risk is the probability that a hazardous substance could cause harm. You need sufficiently high exposure to trigger a high enough probability of harm, that's what risk is. Sufficient exposure that harm will occur. So the hazard traits in SEPA are broad. Section 64 talks about toxic or capable of becoming toxic. That's very broad. I wanna say that in, in the, that definition, and the, the breadth of the definition, the lack of specificity has and continues to allow the chemical management plan to avail themselves of new science on, for example, developmental neurotoxicity, um, toxicity call, causing epigenetic changes, um, reproductive toxicity, because most risk assessments are conducted such that the most sensitive endpoint, that's the most sensitive adverse effect is considered when you've got the data. 
but the implementation depends on the branch. So for example, developmental neurotoxicity is not consistently considered. What is developmental neurotoxicity? Changes usually uh, brought on during fetal exposure, just uh, subtle changes in behavior, such as increase in anxiety, uh, increase in ADHD-like behavior. Um, implementation absolutely depends on uh, reliable data. That's really a problem. But also, there's no language, or uh, we. I, I although the flexibility is important we have no minimum triggers for toxicity. In comparison, the European Union's REACH legislation has clear triggers for CMR, carcinogenicity, mutagenicity, and reproductive health. CMR, hazardous, high hazard. So what forms are needed? So more on hazard traits. There's a growing body of opinion. I would say it's opinion, um, that persistence needs to be considered as a clear hazard trait. It is considered. It's considered in ecotoxicity. It's considered somewhat in human um, tox assessment, but it's not a clear trigger. If it was, we would not have PFAS in every corner of the globe, including the Canadian Arctic. We should consider mobility. Here's another case where PFAS would have been um, identified as being harmful because PFAS is so highly mobile. We should consider the ability to, faci to facilitate material circularity. What enables a material to be recycled? Black carbon in takeout food containers completely nixes the opportunity to recycle those containers. That speaks to sustainability. How am I doing, April? How many more? You're at 15 minutes. Oh, dear. You can okay. wrap up in the next two. Oh, boy. Okay. <laughs> what reforms are needed? Risk assessment, vulnerable populations. We need, so when I, we speak of vulnerable populations, we speak of vulnerability to increased exposure and susceptibility to adverse effects. Um, we don't have sufficient data on exposure of vulnerable populations in Canada, specifically low income and racialized Canadians. And our toxicity assessments don't look at multiple stressors that can cause increased vulnerability to toxicity. And here I wanna point out that what CEPA is currently doing is going to the mean, that is, this is sort of the average response, but the it's a very small but significant proportion of the population at the tail end of having very high exposure that experiences adverse effects. We need data. The case of PFAS. I was going to put a slide in and then I thought better of it. Uh, a colleague at, uh, 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 who has since, a colleague uh, in the government, I'm remaining very vague. I uh, uh, shared some data with me on uses of PFAS. I really wanted to run with the data, um, investigate it more, make it public, and was told, no, you first of all, no, you can't. Second of all, the data are totally unreliable on registered uses of PFAS in Canada because it's only first time uses. We don't know what uses are continuing. Uh, we don't, as I mentioned, we don't have exposure and toxicity data for vulnerable populations. We need to update NPRI. I do want to say that uh, I do be I, I believe that we will need in vitro methods in order to address the huge number of chemicals on the market, and that includes new approach methodologies or NAMs. Um, and we do have to use re uh, read across for um, data-poor substances. We have very little information on UVCBs, uh, substances of unknown or variable composition of biological materials, and we have very few tools to actually do those assessments. Polymers are really important. Industries move from um, single mobile chemicals to polymers. Very little information and uh, restrictions on polymers. We need to implement the idea of considering essential uses. Should PFAS be used in essential uses? Um, one essential use, for example, might be 
photolithography of the um, uh, uh, microchips that are enabling us, all, all of us to connect. I don't know if that's an essential use. So far, there aren't alternatives. Speaking of which, we need, to, we need alternatives assessment embedded in reviews. We need to take a class approach. If we were taking a class approach, we wouldn't just be gathering data on PFOS, PFOA, and long chain uh, carboxylic acids. We would be treating PFAS as a class. So to reach that vision, it means uh, a critical, it also means a critical analysis of what sustainable development means, which is um, some have called an oxymoron. It loops back to conflict of interest. I'm very skeptical of promises of green chemistry in achieving that sustainability. And I'm done. Thank you. Thanks very much, Miriam. I really like the title of your last slide. <laughs> the end of my presentation, not our work. All right. And uh, with that, I will say thank you, Miriam, for that presentation. And next, we'll hear from Mark Winfield. Professor of Environmental and Urban Change at York University. He is also co-chair of the faculty's Sustainable Energy Initiative and coordinator of the Joint Master of Environmental Studies Juris Doctor program offered in conjunction with Osgood Hall Law School. He was involved extensively in the first SEPA review and chaired the Biotechnology Caucus of the Canadian Environmental Network. Mark, take it away. Great, thanks April. Um, I wanna start by uh, echoing Hugh's comments about uh, Meinhard and uh, just how significant a loss that is. Um, and it's it's been um, a bad year that way too, because of course we, earlier this year, we also lost Doug McDonald uh, from U of T who was in uh, many ways, one of the pioneers of, of environmental policy in Canada and its study. Uh, so, so, huge losses on both my mind heart, it's just uh, unbelievable. Um, so uh, today I'm, I'm not talking about energy, oddly enough, uh, but uh, it's back to SEPA having now been involved for uh, approaching 30 years. Um, and and on the one hand, I'm, I'm pleased that apparently I still have some relevance, um, although also frightened about the extent to which um, the same issues we dealt with back in 1994 uh, seem to still be very much on the table. Uh, and just as, as background, it's important to recall that, that SEPA is, is sort of the federal government's most comprehensive environmental protection legislation. So it deal, deals with a whole range of different things. And that partially reflects the fact that it was actually a, an, an amalgam of a whole series of previous pieces of legislation, um, deals with toxic substances, uh, dealt for the first time explicitly with biotechnology, something around which there simply was no framework at all, um, has provisions dealing with transboundary movement of hazardous wastes and materials, international air and water pollution, fuels, engines, ocean dumping, uh, operations within the federal government itself. Um, relevant to Miriam's comments, I mean, there are provisions around information gathering and data dissemination, an area in which the, the federal government's powers are, are essentially unlimited in, in a constitutional context. Um, but it is still also striking that given the scope of the authority and the fact that it's been upheld on constitutional grounds several times, um, Progress still seems to be painfully slow. Um, and in some areas, we don't seem to make any progress at all. And indeed, we, we may be going backwards. Um, Miriam's already spoken to uh, the painfully slow progress on assessing uh, potentially toxic chemicals and substances, um, particularly those already in widespread commerce, the extent to which the processes have not caught up with the current state of science. Um, that we seem to be uh, the the effectiveness of the provisions around new substances uh, and new uses is is I think unexplored or unexamined territory is supposed to be preventative and it's not clear how effective that is actually being. 
Um, there is also a concern, not only the sort of the, the assessment of substances is, is only the front end of the process. Um, the question arises too about, well, what do you do when you discover that something is toxic? And there again, um, movement has been very slow. Uh, there's reluctance to use the tools that are available, uh, like pollution prevention planning more effectively. Uh, there are complex processes both within the federal government and uh, with the provinces which have to be navigated. Um, I think at one point I was told by uh, the director general around toxic substances that actually doing something um, substantive involves something like 13 trips to cabinet. Um, and anybody who's been inside the federal government has some, some sense of what that might involve. Um, uh, Joe Castrilli and others have noted, you know, there, there are, if you look in the NPRI, da NPRI data, there are some disturbing trends, particularly increases in transfers of materials to disposal um, versus reductions of air pollution. But the implication there, for example, is that we're, we're just moving pollutants around between media. We're not actually reducing their production and use. Um, there are, in the context of the current bill that's now made its way through the Senate, um, concerns that we, in some areas, seem to be moving, if anything, backwards, um, in particular around the uh, structure of what's called Schedule 1, which is the list of toxic substances. And in some ways, this is the, the regulatory core of SEPA um, that once a substance is placed on Schedule 1, then all of the regulatory authorities that exist in the act in relation to toxic substances come into play. And they are very, very comprehensive. They involve potentially not just restrictions on release, but use, import, manufacturing, uh, labeling, almost, almost any dimension of, of the production use or disposal of a substance you care to imagine. Um, so, you know, how things get on the list of toxic substances and the toxic substances list itself is very crucial um, because in the Hydro-Quebec decision in 1997, um, the Supreme Court essentially uh, recognized that the status of a substance on the list of toxic substances made it a valid object of the federal government's uh, constitutional authority over criminal law, um, essentially provides the constitutional foundation uh, for the regulation of these substances. And uh, we now seem that there's a notion to, to split um, the list of toxic substances into two parts. And this seems uh, extremely unwise um, for a variety of reasons. The, the original uh, provisions of the act around this were a very, very careful constitutional construction, um, which were designed to sort of define the, 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 the uh, boundedness of, of that which was on the list and to highlight its significance, effectively justify its status as, as an object of, of exercise of federal authority. Um, it was also very carefully drafted as well to cover um, and to provide federal authority in relation to substances which are not um, hazardous in the conventional sense of, of presenting a direct inherent threat to human health and the environment, something like mercury. Uh, but it was actually very carefully worded also to capture more systemic threats, um, things like ozone depleting substances, uh, greenhouse gases, um, single use plastics have all fallen into the category and provided the foundation for federal action. Um, it seems to me these, these provisions are, are best left alone, um, given that they seem to have functioned well and provided the degree of flexibility that was needed. Industry doesn't like the toxic label. Um, I must admit my response to that is too bad. Um, you know, the, the definition is, is quite clear in its scope and legislation and has been judicially recognized. Um, there are also, uh, a series of what are essentially procedural rights um, around environmental issues. Um, although any notion of a substantive right to a clean or healthy environment uh, 
remains horatory and preambulatory and not very operational. And indeed, even the procedural rights that were set up in the original legislation, CEPA 99, have proved to be very limited value. The environmental protection action provisions have never really been, been employed. And even um, the requirements around public notice and comment are of, of limited value, given that the thing they don't cover, among other things, is, is um, what you might describe as operational decisions, the actual issuing of permits and things, additions of things to domestic substances list, um, which would really provide more of a window on, on the operations of the act. Um, it was, uh, I think, a significant step forward that we got part six dealing with biotechnology into the legislation back in 1999. Um, but again, this is an area of, of longstanding challenges. Um, it's, it's unclear how effective these provisions have been in terms of providing useful oversight of new or novel organisms. Um, I think there are some interesting proposals out there now in terms of, again, the same things that Miriam was raising in relation to, to toxic substances are issues of need. Um, and do we, should we be assessing the need of, for certain things before we go introducing them into the environment and all the risks that that may carry and sort of magnifying existing problems? Um, and then should we be thinking about alternatives? Um, are there better ways, lower risk ways of achieving the same outcomes? Um, these are all things that, that uh, there is, around which there is profound opposition, uh, both among established economic interests and within the federal government. I mean, this, this very definitely moves outside of the risk-based paradigms uh, that really have defined the act, that the, the paradigm remains fundamentally responsive and, and beyond relatively immediate threats um, to human health or the environment, um, we're not going to ask deeper questions about should we be doing something or should we be allowing something into commerce in the first place. Um, these kind of touch on some, some other long-standing themes that we've not really found answers to. Um, that the legislation as drafted outside of the, the sort of area of toxic chemicals um, functions very much as a backstop as opposed to a benchmark in relation to things that are regulated by other agencies, uh, food and drug being an obvious one, pesticides, another one, um, agricultural inputs, fertilizers, seeds, which of course, particularly seeds encompass products of biotechnology. Um, the way the act was worded is, is that SEPA is, is very much a backstop. It applies if nothing else applies, as opposed to setting a standard of review and assessment uh, as a benchmark that other agencies, if they purport to regulate things under other pieces of legislation, say pesticides, um, genetically modified organisms under agricultural legislation, um, would have to meet. And that sort of is the product of, of even larger sort of battles that occurred within the federal government and continue to this day uh, around who should regulate. And, and as Miriam highlighted, you know, behind that are questions about, well, who are they actually responsive to? Um, and that's a big question when it comes to things like pesticides or products of biotechnology. Um, the same problems continue to uh, apply in relation to the federal provincial dynamics. Um, there are still provisions which require extensive consultation with provinces before federal action can be taken. Um, this introduces layers of delay uh, at a time when we, we don't really necessarily need that much delay. And of course, um, reinforced by the consideration, at least in a few provinces, uh, their commitment to environmental matters is, is suspect um, and their vulnerability to the voices who may not be very keen on change is, is probably acute. Um, I think I might leave it there uh, for now as an introduction in terms of where some of the, the big questions kind of lie, uh, but it is, you know, 
are we are we making progress uh, around the problems that that Miriam so clearly defined? Indeed, we seem to be at risk in some ways of, of moving backwards. Are we making full use of the provisions that the act that already exist and, and how effective are they? Um, we seem to not be making progress on environmental rights. And there are these, these larger questions of where um, does SEPA fit within the, the national or federal regulatory regimes around product substances and activities that pose threats to human health and the environment, and then how that regime functions uh, relative to the roles of provincial governments. And that might be, as I say, um, a good place to, to leave off and invite questions. Thank you very much, Mark. Okay, at this point, I'm going to ask all of our presenters and staff from Nature Canada and CELA who might be answering questions to turn their cameras on. Uh, you're welcome to unmute yourselves as well. So to all of our, to everyone listening, if you have questions, um, if you could put those in the chat box, we can answer those now. And while you're formulating your questions and while you are putting your questions in the chat box, uh, I'm going to ask, I didn't hear this addressed and maybe it's because I was also answering questions in the chat. So I apologize if this is duplicative, but I wonder if um, someone is on the line could just talk for a moment about where SEPA is at in the legislative process. So that might be a question for Mark Butler or Hugh or Joe or Faye. Um, maybe I'll start. Um... The uh, Senate passed um, Bill S-5 on uh, near the end of June 2022, uh, at which point it <clears throat> was ready to be presented to the House of Commons. It has not yet actually been introduced in the House of Commons, but is expected to be introduced, I would say, within the next few weeks, uh, at which point after first reading it'll, and, and second reading will most likely go to um, uh, a committee of the House for consideration in the latter part of October and November. Okay, thank you, Joe. And I had another question. No, I'm going to save that for the end. Okay. So while folks are thinking about their questions, feel free to pop your questions in the chat at any point. Um, did any of either of our panelists or either of our speakers or any of the staff that are on the line want to kind of reemphasize something or was there something that we didn't touch on that you were hoping we were going to during the session? Now would be the time that you could share those thoughts if you'd like to. Mark has his hand up. Go ahead, Mark Winfield. Uh, mostly a question for Joe. Um, is the, the somewhat unusual legislative pathway that's been followed here hmm. um, of the legislation coming, being introduced first in the Senate uh, and then making its way to the House. Um, what are the implications of that in terms of, of the scope of review? Because because you know it's it's not government legislation in the conventional way that one would think of it, it having been introduced by the minister on behalf of her, his majesty, <clears throat> her majesty at the time. Um, does that change the scope of, of the review? Because I recall in the, the original SEPA review, I mean, ultimately everything as government legislation was bound back to the memorandum to cabinet that had defined the drafting instructions that had been issued in relation to the 1999 version of SEPA. Um, nothing could be changed outside of the scope of that memorandum to cabinet. I'm wondering, does, the, does this pathway change that in terms of the scope of, of the legislation and, the, and what is on the table in a review? Well, I, uh, thanks for the question, Mark. Um, I think the um, expectation of the government, if I can uh, put myself in the mind of the government for a moment, was that uh, in allowing the bill to go to the Senate first, there would be the opportunity for um, one part of parliament to consider what might be necessary beyond the four corners of the originally introduced bill by by the government of canada and so i think the uh, the hope and expectation was that the senate would in fact expand the ambit of the scope of bill s5 uh, 
um, which um, it's in itself um, is not as expansive as the recommendations, for example, that came out of the uh, standing committee in 2016 about what should, should in fact be reformed. Um, what's come out of the Senate, however, is arguably not much different from what went into the Senate. And so, um, you know, my gut sense is that um, as the matter or as the bill now moves to the House of Commons, there will be something of a, um, a struggle, if not a concern, to try and expand the scope of what folks wanted uh, Parliament to address in S5 that wasn't addressed and what will, in fact, end up being considered by the House of Commons. And that, I, I guess we'll have to wait and see exactly how expansive um, uh, the committee wants to be that's going to consider the bill and what pressures may be put upon the committee not to expand it all that much. You. Mark Butler, did you want to respond? Uh, yeah, I just want to add, I agree with uh, Joe uh, with regards to part five. Uh, Nature Canada is, is focusing particularly on part six. And actually, in the Senate, and uh, you know, I appreciate the the effort the senators took in looking at Part Six. Uh, the senators did make some amendments to Part Six. They added an amendment around uh, public participation, an amendment around need, and I think this was done against the wishes of the government because up to now we have not been able to convince. Um, the government to amend uh, part six, which regulates genetically engineered organisms. But the Senate uh, did, and we're hoping these amendments are going to stick as the uh, bill move, Bill S5 moves to the House of Commons and even be strengthened. Uh, actually, perhaps I could add, I, I agree with Mark that um, uh, part six. Um, was amended in ways not necessarily wanted by the government. And so in that sense, uh, what came out of the Senate is probably an improvement uh, over what went in. But in relation to pollution prevention under part four and um, control of toxic substances under part five, um, uh, really uh, there's no difference now between um, the existing statute, uh, SEPA 1999, and uh, the current version of Bill S-5. And maybe I can also quickly unpack Mark Winfield's question one step further. And that's just to say that two things are true at the same time. One is that cabinet gave permission, if you will, for Bill S-5 to address certain topics. Um, on the other hand, the Senate has uh, less strict rules than the House of Commons. So the result of that, the result of introducing the bill in the Senate is that we did get some additional changes like in like those in part six that Mark Butler's referred to. Both the Senate amendments and any others that advocates and the public want to propose for the House of Commons stage, both of those will still need to get cabinet approval if they exceed what cabinet gave permission for. So as a body, you know, the executive wants to review anything that it didn't approve when the bill was first introduced. So that's kind of what we're up against, including, as I say, the Senate amendments already made. Those have to be approved by the executive, which means the, 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 the officials and cabinet. Thanks, Hugh. Uh, a, a good question just came into the chat, and before I pose it, I'll just remind everyone this is part one of a four-part webinar series, um, and I, I share that reminder because I know we're not going to be able to in-depth answer each of the questions and the many, many topics um, that fall under SEPA. Um, having said that, there was a question, could you briefly talk about the parts of Bill S-5? And I know that's going to be a larger part of, I believe, the second webinar, but maybe someone could do a very quick skim across these part one, part five, part six that we keep throwing around that may not be clear to everyone listening. Um, maybe I could start and um, I'll just focus on two of the parts that were at least um, marginally addressed by uh, Bill S5. Um, part four uh, deals with pollution prevention. 
And uh, that's um, uh, that's been in the bills or that's been in the act since um, uh, 1999, 2000, um, an attempt to uh, address the use and creation of toxic substances, both. Um, uh, so it attempts to uh, really focus on the extent to which we can um, not um, reduce concentrations of substances so much as um, address whether a particular substance needs to be created or needs to be used in first instance. Um, part five, uh, and, and I should say part four, was only marginally touched upon by the Senate. Uh, and so from my perspective, and you're going to hear a lot more about this from me in two weeks and what I suspect will be painful detail by the end. Um, uh, part four is um, largely unchanged from how it exists uh, currently under SEPA. Uh, with some uh, minor changes at the margin. Uh, part five, which is about controlling toxic substances, really is a much, much more a traditional uh, regime of, I'll put it in, in broad uh, terms, pollution abatement, uh, where a lot of the, uh, where all of the regulations under Schedule One um, uh, are generated. Uh, most of them deal with uh, controlling concentrations of particular substances that might be emitted to air or discharged to water. Uh, there also are some um, substances that are that are dealt with in terms of use and availability for use, um, and methods of um, uh, methods of uh, production. Um, again, there were only really marginal changes to uh, SEPA under under um, the Bill Five amendments. And um, uh, the kinds of changes we want to see, um, uh, I'm going to talk about in, as I say, greater detail in two weeks. But those are the two um, parts four and five from an industrial chemicals perspective are the are the heart uh, of the statute. And those were uh, and those two areas where many of the amendments such as they were uh, occurred. OK, thank you, Joe. Just scrolling back in the questions for a moment, there was a good question that I want to make sure we get to, if I can find it now, that was about what are the best steps an individual can take to encourage strengthening SEPA? So comments back from MP, is it best to get something through versus having it delayed, although it misses much? Um, so, I mean, again, I suspect we'll, you know, get into that in some detail in the next webinar, but could we talk for a moment for folks who may only be able to join us today about what individuals might be able to do? Maybe I can start. Um, I think um, uh, we've, uh, CELA has produced a lot of commentary on the adequacy of Bill S-5. And so I guess the first thing to do is to, to read what we've had to say about it. Uh, we're about to release our, our new versions of our submissions uh, and our amendments for the House of Commons, uh, which will be posted in the next week or so. Um, but the gist of what we we'll, we have in these new documents are pretty similar to what we we told the Senate uh, earlier this year. Um, read what we have to say. Um, if you agree, um, write to your member of Parliament. Um, write to the chair of the um, uh, of the Standing Committee on Environment and Sustainable Development. Um, write to the Prime Minister. Uh, those are three things you could do as an individual that would be helpful at this stage. Would anyone else like to weigh in there? Mark Butler, I saw you had replied in the chat. Do you want to share that comment out loud or maybe elaborate on it? Yeah, well, I guess our approach, it's been 22 years since this act has been significantly amended. So uh, let's do as much as possible now. A lot has changed in those 22 years, whether it be our knowledge of chemicals and how they interact with the environment, or understanding of what the risks are of genetic engineering, or uh, um, our understanding and appreciation of indigenous rights. So um, I think we're going to push as hard as possible now for as much to be done now and take the time uh, to do it. And yes, uh, there's no magic bullet to changing the government's mind. I think, uh, they're starting to feel some pressure. Uh, so 
get in touch with the members of the committee, including in particular the Liberal members of the Environment Committee, and I just posted the link there, and your MP and the Minister of Environment. April, maybe I could add a, um, uh, one uh, res response to the question of um, should we just get what we can now and, and move on? Um, Mark's right, this, this statute hasn't been amended in 23 years, um, and the likelihood is, is that it won't be amended again for at least another two decades uh, after this year. Uh, some of the problems that have been identified by the speakers today um, and that are identified in the material that CELA has generated over the last uh, few months uh, identify problems that have been around for close to two decades. And the concern is, is if we don't address these issues now, uh, we're going to be talking about these same issues around the year 2040 that we should have been trying to solve uh, four decades earlier. So uh, my view is um, the government has to consider much more uh, robust uh, amendments to, steep, to SEPA than what they've been prepared to um, uh, put forward to this point in time. Thank you, Joe. And I was quiet there for a moment because I was chasing down the link for SELA's SEPA law reform page. Um, so all of the content that we've produced around SEPA in the last couple of years and historically should be on that page. And I would, then, I would, sorry. No, I was just going to read, sorry. Did you want to add to that, Mark? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would reemphasize the point to quote Dr. Seuss, noise, noise, noise um, <laughs> is, is what is needed um, because you know, there are a lot of interests who would like things to stay the way they are mm -hmm. or to move backwards. And if, MPs and the government aren't hearing from anybody else, that's what will happen. Yeah, yeah great point. Uh, and I should just let people know we we have our session booked until 2.15 today. So in case anyone's worried that we're going over time, we're not, we have 10 minutes left. Um, there was a question that got buried a little bit in the chat here that I want to bring forward because I know it's something that's been talked about a lot um, under the umbrella of SEPA. And is that, is there any prospect for an enforceable remedy for the right to a healthy environment? Recognizing that could be a whole nother topic in and of itself, a whole nother session. Does anyone want to take a minute and answer that or try to answer that? Uh, maybe I could start since we spent some time on this issue uh, in the Senate. Um, there is a provision that I think Mark may have alluded to in his comments, um, the Environmental Protection Action uh, provision, which is uh, Section 22 of the existing act which um, has not been invoked once by any member of the public in 23 years. Uh, the reason for that is that there are a host of procedural uh, um, obstacles that are embedded in the statute that make it well nigh impossible to do so. Um, that problem has been identified by two different um, standing committees of the House of Commons and one standing committee of the Senate uh, since at least uh, 2007. And uh, in fact, um, even though the Senate did not move on the issue, uh, though asked to, to consider doing so this year or this summer, they did, a, they did identify in an observations report um, that very problem, that even if we had a robust right to a healthy environment in Bill S-5, which we do not, um, it would not be enforceable because uh, Section 22 has not been amended. The government didn't propose amending it, and the Senate did not uh, propose amending it. Um, will that change in the House of Commons, I guess, is uh, an interesting question going forward. Mark Winfield, I see your hand up. Yeah. Um, this is an interesting one, I agree, Joe, in terms of SEPA itself. Um, the other pathway, of course, is that, that Linda Duncan, when she was an MP, tried to push the rock of a federal environmental bill of rights up the hill several times, and indeed did get, get it passed second reading uh, at one point in the context of minority parliament. Um, so that is the other, the other potential pathway, though I don't know if anyone has introduced uh, a similar bill in the current round, but that's that's the other way this might happen is through a, a specific standalone piece of legislation, almost certainly a private member's bill. Mm 
Uh, Mark, I could um, advise there is a there is a bill in the House of Commons now by a um, uh, member of Parliament Cannons, um, which um, I'm not sure what its status is. I think it's going to be considered by the House um, this fall, but I, I I don't know the time frame. Sorry, I'm bouncing back and forth between the chat. Um, okay, so we're at 2.08. We've got just uh, six or seven minutes left. And you'll see Faye is now popping some resources into the chat. So she's sharing all of the links that are up on the screen. Um, so all of those links that are on the screen that you can't click on from your computers are going to pop into the chat that, um, now. But we will also be sharing uh, this slide deck, so the opening and the closing slides, Miriam's slides, um, as well as a link to the recording from the session um, via email. So I'm going to give folks another minute if there's a last question that somebody wants to drop in the chat. But um, at this time, I would ask if either Faye or Mark Butler would mind just taking a moment to talk about the next three webinars that are scheduled. So this is a four part series. Today is number one. Um, the other three are all on the same event page that you use to register for today, but you do have to register for each one separately. But if Mark or Faye want to just talk for a moment about what will be the focus of those three, and I'll drop that event page in the chat while you're talking. Sure. I'll start and Mark could add. Um, yeah, so the next um, session is um, scheduled for October 12th. The third one is, uh, the, the first, sorry, the second one is um, focused on the fixes. So some of the information you've heard from Joe and Mark and Hugh and um, others um, are going to be relevant, but we will have um, on, on that call uh, Senator Ga uh, Rosa Galvez, who was instrumental and active in the Senate committee hearings, as well as uh, Joseph Castrilli and Hugh Benavides, um, going into more specifics. Uh, the, third, the third session is scheduled for October 19th, and we're going to have a panel uh, with Indigenous um, representatives um, talking about UNDRIP and a relevancy to SEPA reform. Uh, we will be joined by Senator um, Mary J. McCullum and two of our, um, our Indigenous colleagues, uh, Joshua uh, McNeely and um, uh, Mike Perry. Um, so we're, we're eager to have that um, webinar um, go on. And then the final session will be, uh, will be scheduled for uh, October 26th and will be joined by uh, Meg Sears, and um and oh sorry <laughs> i've forgotten um the other person uh, my apologies mark butler mark mark, it? mark sorry mark <laughs> sorry mark <laughs> that's okay Too many marks um, and we're still and we're still working on the the yes. last two in terms of uh, speakers right. yeah yeah so anything else mark sorry <laughs> no no that that was great uh, thank you i don't it, april do i have time to ask a question of uh, miriam diamond uh, you do. Yeah, we have five okay. minutes left, so we can take another question. Okay, I really appreciated her focus on the risk assessment process and how it's based on hazard and exposure. Uh, because I know with the genetically engineered salmon, which first uh, triggered Nature Canada's interest in, in SEPA, uh, the hazard to wild salmon was considered high, but because uh, they said, you know, this fish is going to be uh, on land in, in land based uh, uh, facilities exposure was low. Um, and every time they could assess a project, they could get that answer. But over time, our estimation is that uh, the exposure will just keep going up and the overall risk will just keep going up. Anyway, my question really is, can you say a bit more about how we could improve the risk assessment process? uh to better capture the risk of both chemicals and genetically engineered organisms sure thanks thanks mark um the first point i'd like to make is that assessments should include high hazard chemicals that um, we should not have to prove high exposure let me give you a very what i believe is a very compelling argument of why it's way too late and ineffective to use a risk assessment framework. I see I've got only a minute or two. Um, technology production ramps up. Uh, in the case of um, uh, fish farming, we're talking about the ramping up 
of um, pharmaceutical or like veterinary products, antibiotics, and so on uh, for that marketplace. By the and then and the whole uh, using fish farming as an example, that whole industry ramps up. By the time a risk is triggered, the game's over. Fish farming is deeply embedded in the economy. Lots of people are getting their incomes from fish farming. The veterinary production has, is embedded. Um, game's over by the time that high risk is triggered, which is why you need hazard assessment. Um, so, and how can we improve? So there's tremendous industry pushback towards uh, considering hazard rather than risk. Because industry would say, everything's okay if you're below a threshold. That's okay if that may be the case in some situations, but not in all. And that's why we need to identify those hazard traits. High hazard out, should be out. How can you improve the risk assessment process? It, it, Part of the situation that you're explaining is the lack of ability to project into the future how situations change and how different populations can be exposed, which is one of the drawbacks of risk assessment. It means um, considering very broadly uh, risk scenarios. And that's hard to do. I mean, that's where precaution comes in. So that I don't know if I addressed your question adequately. Yeah, well, I think, uh, and I think a lot of groups are calling for certain chemicals to be considered high hazard and to be treated differently. And I would say, you know, our position with Nature Canada say around a genetically engineered salmon, which has a wild counterpart, so the risk to wild salmon is high, that those two should be considered high hazard. Correct. So what wasn't understood when the initial scenarios were implemented was the potential for gene jumping, that is gene, jump, uh, genes jumping from um, genetically modified organisms to non-genetically modified organisms. And the, um, and the uh, that GMO organisms would be running rampant in the environment and have the opportunity for gene jumping. So, um, early on, the science wasn't uh, well enough understood. Precaution wasn't used with the possibility of gene jumping. Thank you, Miriam. Okay, recognizing that we are at 2.15, I'm going to call that the last question. Um, and I really want to thank both Miriam Diamond and Mark Winfield for taking the time out of their very busy schedules to present today and to talk to us about this topic. And then also thanks to all the staff from both Nature Canada and from CELA for organizing today's session. Hugh has put um, Mark's email address in the chat box, uh, which is where you can get in touch with Mark to become a subscriber for Mark's newsletter. And I'm putting the link to our newsletter in the chat as well. So that's where you can get additional information. I would encourage everyone to sign up for the additional webinars. Um, as I said, you need to sign up for each of those individually. And then the very last thing I'm going to remind you about, um, if you stay on for half a second after the webinar ends, you're going to get a survey that pops up. If you could take a moment and fill out that survey, I'm also going to put it in the chat box, it just gives us some feedback about the session. And if you have any other questions, Faye DeLeon's contact information is on the closing slide here. You're welcome to get in touch with Faye. And with that, I will say thank you very much to everyone for your time. Thank you for attending today, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Take care, everyone.